Emily Blaine is a premarital financial coach who helps engaged couples figure out how to discuss money and build a stronger relationship. Communication around money is one of the leading causes of marital stress and tension. Talking about money early and getting on the same page can help mitigate that stress and conflict. As a member of the Financial Coaches Network, Emily has developed a program specifically designed to address the needs of engaged couples. In today's podcast, we talk financial planning for couples and relationships and what that looks like. Please enjoy today's episode. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thanks for having me on. I'm really excited to chat with you. So today we're going to be talking about finances and relationships. Yes. Finances and relationships obviously cause challenges for a lot of couples when, you know, we always fight about it or you just avoid it. And then if you do happen to talk about it, it doesn't end up being a great conversation. Yes. So before we get in, tell us a little bit about you and how you got into finances and speaking with couples specifically. So I am one of the very few lucky people who had parents who, A, handled their money well, and B, actually taught me how to do it too. So I, it's been kind of a route to get here, but I eventually was like, wait a second, I have these skills. I was super lucky to be able to do this. How can I kind of pay it forward and pass that on to people who, you know, maybe, maybe their parents didn't handle things well, or maybe they handle things well, but weren't quite sure how to talk about it. Money is one of those things. Not sure if you've noticed. I'm sure you have. People don't really like to talk about money. It's up there with, you know, sex and politics that it's like, ah, let's just not talk about it. Maybe with one or two close friends, but even then not, not a popular topic. So I, you know, grew up being pretty good with money and saw friends and peers, you know, going through college, getting through college, going, oh my gosh, I have so much debt. I don't even know what to do with it. And wanted to kind of figure out how I could help and how I could be that person for people who haven't had anywhere else to learn that. And then I engaged couples was one of the groups that I thought about working with um, when I first started becoming a financial coach about um, at this point, just over two years ago. And I sort of meandered around, my path in life in general has been kind of meandering, but I meandered around, tried different groups, and then came back to, you know what, I really think helping couples figure out how to talk about money together is really important. And oftentimes it's touched on a little bit in premarital counseling. You might have, you know, one session, if you do premarital counseling, which some couples don't, but if you do, you maybe have one session, but I don't think an hour to an hour and a half is really enough time to dig into everything that there can be around money and relationships. So why do so many couples fight about money specifically? There's a lot of negative emotion wrapped up in money for a lot of people. There's a lot of guilt and shame of, oh my gosh, I made choices that looking back, maybe I shouldn't have made. And now I have a bunch of credit card debt or, oh my gosh, I took out you know $100,000 in student loans. And now I have a career making $40,000 and that just doesn't seem worth it. And so I'm guilty about having all of that, or I regret all of that. And a lot of people just don't like talking about negative emotions, which fair, I don't like talking about it either. And a lot of us don't even realize we have all of that negative emotion wrapped up in money. It's just sort of manifests as, I'm just not going to talk about it. Or let's talk about it, but then every time we talk about it, all of this negative emotion bubbles to the surface and we end up just fighting about it. There's also a lot of different views about money. Some people, you know, the stereotypical one person being a spender and one person being a saver. And then the spender feels like they're being judged because they want to spend money on things. And the saver feels like their partner is just frivolous and wasting things when the future is so important. And then you end up butting heads about that. Yeah, that sounds like my husband and I were both um, the ones who are worried about the future, but then mm-hmm. we both want to spend. So we're kind of <laughs> like, we switch back and forth. Yeah. Yep. So when is the best time to talk to someone you're dating about money? Is it the first date, the second date? When do you do that? I think you can start observing things about money pretty early on. I mean, I don't think 
if you want to sit down on the first date and like lay everything out more power to you, I feel like maybe waiting a little longer before having those really in-depth conversations is not a terrible idea. Um, but you can, you can even, even noticing little things like, do they have a whole bunch of fancy things, but they're working at a really low paying job and going, wait a second, something here isn't adding up. And maybe there's reasons behind that. Maybe they're really frugal in other ways. Who knows? So trying to not pass judgment, but noticing things that, or wow, they seem to have a really high paying job, but they've got a really old car and they, you know, wear shirts from Target when they could probably afford $500 shirts going, okay, so then maybe they're more frugal, which again, maybe they're spending on other things and that doesn't necessarily mean anything, but looking for those little things. I also always like dropping sort of little conversation starters. Like if you're watching a movie together or watching TV together and something comes up about money and whatever you're watching going, huh, that's really interesting. How do you think you would handle being in that situation? Or that just sort of little questions to get just a little bit more information before diving into how much money are you making? What's your credit score? How much student loan debt do you have? Do you have any credit card debt? What kind of car payment do you have? All of those things that feel a little more invasive, especially really early on in a relationship. Yeah. I don't remember when it happened, but when I was dating my husband, I remember him going, oh, I have this much uh, student loan debt. I'm like, oh, I don't have any. And he's like, oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that can also impact your relationship if there's an imbalance, whether in salary or in debt level or whatever, that later is a great conversation to have. It's a super important conversation to have, but too early, just like almost anything in a relationship. If you rush it too fast, that can just set things going the wrong direction. So I know a lot of couples where the wife is maybe a stay-at-home mom or a homemaker and she has no idea of all the finances and you see a lot of maybe the real housewives of whatever going <laughs> to jail for tax issues. <laughs> and then these women are like, well, they had no knowledge of it, let's say. Mm -hmm. So for, for the women who think I'm not making the money, so I don't have any say, so why should I even bother asking, what would you say to them? I would say as someone who has been somewhat of a stay-at-home mom, and I still am the primary caretaker for our four-and-a-half-year-old, thankfully, she goes to preschool now, which is a welcome relief. Um, but your kids aren't going to be around forever. They're going to theoretically move out and be independent. That's, I think, sort of the goal for most parents, at least. And at some point, you know, statistically, women outlive men. So theoretically, you may outlive your husband if something happens and he gets in a car accident and is in the hospital or even just has minor surgery that he has to stay in the hospital for a few days. Having that knowledge of these bills need to be paid and this is how I pay them or these bills are on auto pay. So I just need to make sure that the auto pay worked and having just that basic level of knowledge and understanding is really empowering and can really help in if the worst happens and you're, you know, say 35 and you've got two kids, three kids, 10 kids, one kid, whatever, and your spouse dies. If you have that basic understanding of where things are or a more than basic understanding, even just a basic understanding of these are the accounts, this is how I access them. I know roughly how much these bills are, that can make things so much easier if that happens. And none of us like to plan for that. There's a reason a lot of people don't have wills and don't have life insurance and all of that, because we don't want to think about dying before we're, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 down the road. But if that happens, it's really important to be able to financially protect yourself. On the also not pleasant side of things to think about, if something happens and you get divorced, that's also really important to have those skills then as well, because then you don't have that other person to lean on. Mm -hmm. So true. So what are some ways couples who've maybe never discussed money can start the conversation without like just asking for their credit score, which is funny because I actually 
uh, had my dad pull up my husband's credit score when we were dating. <laughs> That's hilarious. How did your husband react when you talked to him, when you told him that? Or did he was you like, tell he, him? He was, no, I told him like, oh, you have a good credit score. score my dad ch- Actually, my dad said, I need your social and this to oh, him. Oh, I suppose. That's a good point. <laughs> yes. It's like, I'm going to need all this information. And then he's like, okay. And he's like, okay, he's good. You could do it. How long had you been dating at that point? Um... Maybe a few months, but he had wanted okay. to go on a vacation with me to like uh, uh, another country. So my dad's like, let's get everything <laughs> ordered first. That's awesome. Your dad sounds amazing. <laughs> okay. So if you've never had the conversation and you don't have a father who's going to check your date's credit score, um, which if you do, that's a great excuse to be like, oh my gosh, my dad, he just, he, I, I swear you'll love him when you get to know him, but he just has to check your credit score. Sure, sure. My parents always said, you know, feel free to blame us if you don't want to do something. Uh, But assuming you are an adult and theoretically you are doing an adult things and not just blaming your parents for everything. Um, Like I mentioned earlier with the dating, if you are really concerned about bringing things up, you can drop those little hints of, oh, what would you do if you were in that situation? Or if this happened, how do you think we would handle it? Or should we handle it? That kind of thing. I also think if you're really ready to be like, you know, say you are that stay-at-home mom who doesn't have, you know, doesn't really feel like you have any knowledge of the family finances, or you're both of you work and that's just still always been your husband's area of expertise, or you both kind of handle it, but you've never talked about it, saying, you know, I really think learning more about our family finances would be really useful for me. Can we set a time to sit down and talk about it? Generally, springing mon- money conversations on people doesn't go so well because that's a great way for the other person to go, ah, and get really defensive and feel like you're questioning them. So if you can approach it from a, I'm curious about this and let's talk about this as a team and let's set a time when, you know, if you have kids, the kids are in bed or you know, off playing with friends, which may or may not be happening during COVID. But um, it's at a time when the kids are not going to be in the picture, when you're both in a good mood, you're not tired, you're definitely not hungry. That's my personal downfall. I get hangry very easily. So make sure you're not hungry. <laughs> you know, maybe right after dinner, eat while you're talking, have a glass of wine, make it, make it a relaxed, romantic setting which I know seems kind of weird, romance and money. But if you have, if you set a money date, say, you know, Friday after the kids are in bed, after the week, we'll have a nice dinner with the kids, you know, put them to bed. Let's have a glass of wine and let's just kind of talk through some stuff. So I'd say number one tip, don't spring it on them. And number two, try to make it as relaxed as possible. Yeah, I usually wait till we're on a date night and mm-hmm. he's had maybe a few drinks and there's yeah. like candlelight and everything. I'm like, mm-hmm. so how are things with the finances? Mm-hmm. Yep. It sounds like you're checking out all those boxes <laughs> I just said. <laughs> so how often should we have these um, discussions about money? Is it like a one and done once every couple of years? Preferably more than once every couple of years. I would say minimum once a month. If you haven't done it much once and you're really trying to, you know, get on the same page as a couple once a week to start would be great and plan on there being some weeks where literally all you do is go, anything to talk about? Not really. Okay, great. Let's watch Netflix. But that way you know that it's there. And especially if it's a situation where one person is more focused on saving for the future and one person is more focused on living in the now. And so there might be some tension there that gives you a time to say, okay, let's not argue about this now. We have our money date on Friday or on Tuesday or on Saturday morning or whatever. Let's add it to the agenda and we'll talk about it then. And whether that's a literal written agenda and a literal conversation of let's not argue about it now, let's do it later. Or if you just think to yourself, take a deep breath, take a step back. We have this on the calendar to talk about. Let's make sure we cover it then. And again, then being careful not to, like if you're grumpy that your spouse spent money on something, don't build that up into this big thing in the three days that you're waiting. Let that be a waiting period to go, okay, let's take a step back, a literal step back if you need to. Um, 
maybe even say, you know, it kind of bothered me that you bought this. Can we talk about it? So they know that it's coming, but trying not to make it any sort of accusatory conversation. Keep it as we are a team. Let's build some common goals. And we're sitting down to talk about how we can meet those together. And what are some of the most common things specifically that couples will fight about in regards to money? I think the number one thing, which we've kind of touched on, is the saving and spending. Um, I heard a financial therapist on a different podcast recently talk about it the way I kind of framed it of oftentimes one person is more future focused and the other person is more now focused. And I feel like that's a little bit less judgy than spender and saver because everybody wants to be a, a saver, right? You know, everybody wants to have savings, but then we judge the, the spender. So future focused versus present focused and trying to figure out how to balance that when one person wants to put everything away for the future and the other person is like, okay, sure. That's, you know, theoretically sounds great to have money in the future, but what about now? I want to live life now and how you find that balance. Yeah, that's very relatable. I remember um, I'm a big saver. I have mm -hmm. my little hoard of money that I like mm -hmm. to keep. And then my husband has his and we have ours together. And I always know like um, he'll get kind of crazy around planning vacation. He's like, oh, do I want to do that? Or we'll just like <laughs> save that money. Like, think of all mm -hmm. like the security it'll give us and yeah. we don't have to worry about it. I'm just like, if we don't go on a vacation at least once a year, <laughs> we'll go insane. <laughs> it's finding that balance. So why should couples talk about their finances in detail and how much detail are we talking about? Do we have to tell them everything? I think once you are engaged and or married, knowing the details is important and it doesn't have to be if if you have everything in combined bank accounts then obviously you should know details because literally everything is combined if you have separate bank accounts or a joint account and separate accounts i don't necessarily think you have to be like oh how many dollars and cents down to the penny do you have in your you know personal bank account um but having a general idea of like especially if you have separate retirement savings or that kind of thing. You should at least have a good, solid general idea and you should update each other regularly. Just like anything else in a relationship, you have to be on the same page. You have to be communicating about things. And if one person is saving, like, like if you do have a combined account for bills and then individual accounts for spending money, which is a pretty common practice, um, and one person just seems to be spending all the time and their partner has no idea. And they're like, the Amazon boxes just keep showing up. Like, are you saving anything? I have no, like, great. Our bills are being paid, but what else? Then that can build up a lot of tension and a lot of I mean, suspicion almost of, are you just spending all of your money? I mean, I know it's your money and we work this out, but what about, you know, when we retire and I'm set up to retire and you have nothing. So having, having that, transparency, I think is really important. Is it enough to have a general sense of your partner's spending habits and bills, or do you need to know every specific detail? I think, again, that kind of depends on how your finances are structured and how far you want to go. I mean, getting down to, tell me what you're spending every cent on can be really controlling and that's not good. It's not good to be controlled. It's not good to control your partner. If it's like my husband and I do track literally every single cent. Not everybody wants to do that. Not everybody has time to do that. Not everybody is that the right solution. But, you know, so we do that and that works for us. If you don't like that, you know, say a previous relationship, you had a partner who did control you, then that can kind of be a, a trigger then to be like, uh, well, so a couple of years ago when I was dating this person, they, you know, wanted me to account for literally every single cent. I can't do that. And hopefully your current partner, husband, boyfriend, fiance, whatever, will then understand that and be like, okay, I understand. So I think having a general sense is probably okay in a lot of cases, if it works. It's a lot of things with money is if it works for you, it works. If it doesn't work for you, then talk about it and figure out what might work better, what's not working and how you can fix that. 
Is there a general formula for what you should be saving versus spending every month? It depends. <laughs> it's everything. Um, there are some budgeting systems where they're percentage based. So one, one common one is 50, 30, 20, which is spend 50% of your income on bills and expenses, spend 20% on, well, save 20% or, and use that for debt payoff and then 30% discretionary. Um, then you can adjust that percentage as you want. The, the exact amounts, again, depend on how much you're making. I mean, if you're, if, if your bills are, you know, for easy numbers, $900 a month and you're making $1,000 a month, there's not much wiggle room left there. If your bills are $1,000 a month and you're making $10,000 a month, there's a lot more flexibility. And so I think figuring out how much is left over after you pay bills is sort of the first step. And then figuring out what percentage of that can we save. General rule of thumb is minimum 10% ideally save for the future, invest for the future. Um, the more, the better to a certain extent. Um, but yeah, in, as, is, as with everything, it kind of depends, <laughs> which I and, know is not helpful. <laughs> no, I know it, it's crazy, especially if you have um, your own, both of you have your own businesses and mm -hmm. you don't always have the same income and expenses yeah. per month. And then you're like always kind of up in the air about it. In, so it in gets that, yeah. In that situation, if you do have variable income, whether it's because you have your own business or you know, maybe you work in a restaurant and so you get tips and so that changes every day, then in that case. Um, I'm a big fan of creating a buffer so that when you have, you know, again using an easy number of five thousand dollars, if that's sort of an average, if then on the months where you have make seven thousand dollars, two thousand of that goes into a pool, so that then when you make a you've got a $4,000 a month, you've got that money to kind of make up that average. So you can kind of even things out because that can be really stressful if you're like, well, I don't know if, how much money we're making this month or next month or the month after that. That can kind of help stabilize things and make it a little bit easier to handle. Yeah. Um. One thing that I figured out, I don't remember the exact percentages because it's been years since I came up with this. So my husband was always like, I don't know how much can, I'm going to make, so I can't tell you how much mm -hmm. for anything. So then I would be like, okay, every time you get something, you have to, if let's say it's $100, you have to split that into the percentages. This mm -hmm. for savings, this for bills, this for you know float money or whatever. And then you have the separate accounts and you always just put it in there. So then every time there's income, you can kind of see where you are in every section. Yep. I, are you familiar with the book Profit First? No. Okay. Because that's exactly what he recommends in that book. Oh, okay. so there's a whole book written about that system you talked about where you set aside X percent for this and X percent, X percent for, in this case, profit, um, X percent for owner salary or employee salary, X percent for operations and taxes and all that. So exactly what you just said, that can also be really helpful to help things feel a little bit less crazy. Yes. It really helps keeping you from going out of control. Yeah. So is there a best budgeting method? Is that possible? No, <laughs> there is not a best budgeting method. There are a ton of different budgeting apps and systems out there. You can do expense tracking using something like Mint, where essentially you're just putting in all of your expenses and categorizing them and then sort of setting goals for where you want to be in the future. There's zero-based budgeting um, using apps like YNAB, which stands for You Need a Budget, um, where you're accounting for every penny and you're saying, I have this much money in my bank account and it's divided into these things, kind of a digital cash envelope method. There's the actual cash envelope method where you pull money out of the bank and put it in literal envelopes. And then you take your grocery money envelope to the grocery store. Um, there's the percentage-based budget that I talked about earlier where it's just, you know, we're going to put X percentage into this account and X percentage into this account. And we know that this account is our spending money. And when that's gone, then it's gone until we get paid again. So there's there are budgeting methods that work for all ranges of time. Like if you want to spend the time being really nitty gritty, you can definitely do that. If you're like, 
that just sounds terrible. I don't have time for that. That sounds awful. I think I would just go curl up in a ball and cry every time I felt like I had to do that. Then don't do that. Then open a couple different bank accounts and set up automatic transfers so that it can just be hands off and you can just say, okay, I have the debit card for this account. When my debit card doesn't work, I can't spend any more money from that account. And then if I'm spending money, I have to pull it from the account that I already said was set aside for savings or for bills or whatever. What kind of financial goals should couples be setting together? I think most of the goals that couples set together should, well, I'd say most of the goals involve finances, even if they're not directly money based. If you think about, you know, we have a goal of buying a house in five years. Obviously, that's a big financial choice. So setting, talking about that kind of thing. Even things like, do we want to have kids? Involves a lot of money. Kids are expensive. Then you have to get down into what kind of child care. You know, when, the, when we have a baby, is one of us staying home? Are we putting them in a daycare center? Are we hiring a nanny? Do we have parents who can take care of the baby? And then, you know, when they get older, they want to go to college. Are, do we want to be able to pay for some of that or all of that? Do we not mind about that? Are we going to encourage them to go to community college first and then go to a four-year school? Are we going to say, go to trade school? Do we care about college? You know, all of those decisions that have financial impacts. So I think set down, make goals together. Think about, you know, let's say we're 10 years in the future. What do we want our life to look like? And then work backwards from there. You know, in 10 years, we're going to have two kids and a four bedroom house. Okay. What needs to happen in order to be at a point where that vision can come true? And how can we make progress towards that now? What should someone do if they're just not comfortable sharing their goals with their partner? I would say if you're not comfortable sharing your goals with your partner, find a marriage therapist is ideally, I mean, certainly it's not always true for me. Um, there are definitely things that are hard to talk to my husband about. We've been married almost 10 years. Um, but you want your partner to be the person that you can talk to about anything. And if you feel like you can't, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not a good relationship. It probably just means you need somebody to teach you how to do that. And most of the time, what I have found is that the things that I'm worried about talking about, he's like, oh, but what if he says this? Or what if he reacts this way? He pretty much never says that or reacts that way. I, I am one of those people who tends to blow things up in my head the longer I sit and worry about it. So if there's no history of your partner reacting very negatively when you talk about things like that, then consider finding a relationship therapist to help you talk through that and figure out how to improve those communication skills. Yeah, I do think when it comes to talking and communicating, it is how you do it and the energy you bring to the conversation. Yeah. Because you can talk about anything if you have good energy and they won't get mm -hmm. kind of upset. But yeah. um, I'm trying to think of things that people wouldn't want to share with their partners. I'm thinking maybe if like the woman wants to maybe girl go on a girl's trip or get plastic surgery. She doesn't want to tell her husband about yeah. it or things like that. Cause I'm like wondering like, what would you not want to tell your husband? Well, even something as simple, I was going to say simple. It's not really simple, but this would hopefully be more in the dating conversation saying, I don't want to have kids that can, there's a lot of stigma around not having kids still, especially for women. It's, doesn't, it's not as weird if guys don't want to have kids, but if a woman says, I don't want to have kids, it's like, what's wrong with you? It's like, well, there's really nothing wrong with you. Um, but that fear of judgment or saying, I want to be a stay-at-home mom or I don't want to be a stay-at-home mom. That also, you know, in some parts of the country, some parts of the world, there's still some assumptions about, oh, we'll get married, you'll work, we'll have kids, then you'll stay home. And saying, I don't really want to do that. I want to be a working parent. Or for a dad to say, I want to be a stay-at-home dad. That's another thing where it's like, wait, what? Just sort of take a step back and go, I wasn't expecting that. So any, any of those goals that sort of go against social norms or mm -hmm. plans for the future that even, even something is, again, I keep, I keep wanting to say it's as simple. Nothing is actually simple, but um, as straightforward as 
I want to go back to school. That's a huge time commitment. That's a huge money commitment that can be kind of scary to bring up. But again, hopefully, ideally, the person you are dating or married to, if they're not somebody that you can talk to, then that's something to look into a little bit more. Yeah, I do remember when we decided to have a kid, we did not want to have kids first for <laughs> years. We were very happy not having kids. Mm -hmm. And then we started making money. And then my husband's like, I don't know, should we have a kid? Because like, <laughs> why are we making all this money? Are we going to leave it to? And I'm like, oh, I mean, I guess. Yeah, maybe well, let's do that. So we had the kid. We didn't think it through all the way. And it turns out <laughs> childcare is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Like there are some numbers I've seen from people who live in like, you know, I'm in, I'm in the Midwest. So we have a relatively low cost of living, but people who live in California where I'm like, they're paying a thousand dollars more a month than I pay for my mortgage. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, if you want someone to watch your kid, I'm in Miami. If you want someone to watch your kid <laughs> all the work days, because school holidays, most of the daycares and stuff like that are, are closed and you can't have that many days off of work for like teacher planning days. So you need to find one of those places that do like the full, you know, work day. And those places can be as much as 2000 or more a month. Yeah. So it's, it's crazy. crazy. I mean, <laughs> why, why, why have yeah. kids then? So then I have a lot of my girlfriends who think it's so affordable to have kids because they're just looking at like the daycare prices mm -hmm. that are based off of like the school schedule with all the days yeah. off. And they're like, oh, 300 bucks. So a week I can afford that or like, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. And then when they find out, oh, wait, I can't have a job. Yeah. I, I can't do it because I have to be home to pick up my kid at this time and be off on all the teacher planning days and all these things. And then you realize, wait a minute, I can't work. So now I don't have my income mm -hmm. unless I have to do all this other stuff. So it gets crazy yeah. really fast <laughs> and people don't think about those things. Mm -hmm. And kids are almost one of those. And wait, there's more. And it's like, there's always more. There's always more. And it's like, oh, well, once they go to kindergarten, then you don't have to pay for daycare all the time. But like you were just saying, that's not entirely true because you do still have those teacher planning days and then you start getting into extracurricular activities and sports and music and all of that. Kids are expensive. Yes, expensive and they're a full-time job. It's really <laughs> crazy. Yeah. So, so mor moral of that story being talk to your partner about kids and if you want them or not and how you can financially afford them. Yes, and actually go and do the budgeting for the kid yeah. first. Cause don't just think, oh, this is, I can afford this. Cause you never know how crazy it is. And then um, the health insurance for children. Mm -hmm. Like if you make a good amount of money, that's like maybe six, $800 a month you have to worry about additional. So it, yeah. it adds up really fast and then they want things. I know <laughs> that's the worst. <laughs> I remember when my daughter got into the like finally realizing like the stuff in the store you can buy she's like oh, i want that i want that i want that i want that I'm like, oh it was so much nicer when it would be like oh that's cool yeah isn't that cool let's keep going but that first time you buy them something the wheels start turning and then all of a sudden they want everything and then the toy catalogs come at christmas and like i'm gonna mark everything so that i get everything like that's not how it works <laughs> yeah yeah, crazy. So <laughs> what is value-based budgeting? Can you explain that? Yeah, so value-based budgeting, I think, is one of the most important budgeting rules, system. It's not a rule, it's not a system, sort of philosophies. Go with philo one of the best budgeting philosophies, which essentially it's a fancy way of sending, saying, make sure you're spending money on things that matter to you rather than things that matter to other people or things that don't matter and you just sort of happen to be blowing money on. So you figure out what you're spending your money on and then go, is that important to me? Do I value spending money on that? So if you're going, if you're getting takeout all the time, rather than going, oh, I know we shouldn't get takeout all the time, going, okay, we're getting takeout. Is it important to me? Yes, because I'm really busy, my spouse is really busy, we need to fit, feed the kids and it's an easy way to do it. Check, value-based spending, done. Or 
no, because I know we could be doing it better. We could have cheaper meals at home and I would rather be using that money for something else. Then no, so then you start trying to make those adjustments. So rather than looking at something and just sort of immediately assigning it, yes, this is good spending, no, this is bad spending, going, what is the what are our values and does this line up with them? Yeah. So an example would be like for my husband and I, we are very picky about food quality. Mm. So we have to get the best olive oil, the most organic beef, grass fed, grass finished, and those Mm -hmm. things cost more money. But since we value our health, we'll spend more money on that and maybe we don't have the best clothes or shoes or whatever. Right. That would be an example. Exactly. Whereas somebody else might go, you know, wearing name brand shirts is really important to me. So I'm only going to buy these shirts that are, you know, t-shirts that are $100 a piece, but I really don't care about organic. So I'm just going to go shop at Walmart or Aldi or whatever your cheaper grocery store um, chain is. So yeah, it's about figuring out what's important to you and making sure that your money is reflecting that. So is that a good conversation to have like on the values when you're dating? I think so. Not with someone who's the complete opposite. Yeah. That can be a challenge if you like, if you are, if you love travel and you love nice travel, like you want to be flying first class and staying at fancy resorts and that's really important to you. And your partner is like, yeah, I'm fine just staying home or yeah, travel sounds great, but can't we just stay in hostels and like Airbnbs and like take public transportation? Why do we need to go on fancy tours and cruises? That is not, again, not saying that that can't work because it absolutely can, but that's something to be aware of and to have those conversations, especially when you're dating, because being aware of this is a potential conflict point in the future is always a good thing to know. (laughs) Yes, I do remember my husband and I had that conversation when we were dating. He was very much adamant about, I cannot go to any hotel that I haven't checked all the ratings thoroughly for bed bugs. Yeah. I'm afraid of that. And I can't have mold because my yeah. sinuses. And then I'm like, oh, well, I need a place that has a nice restaurant and a coffee shop in it <laughs> to be happy. There you and- well, that sounds like that aligns pretty well. Yeah. Whereas Hopefully. other people, they're just like the cheapest motel on the side of the road. It mm-hmm. doesn't matter. We can rough it or I can sleep in my car. Yeah. <laughs> Not us. And figuring that kind of thing out or rather than just travel, you know, I want to have a four bedroom house in the suburbs with the white picket fence. Well, I kind of want an a apartment in the city. One bedroom is fine. You know, if people come visit, they can stay at a hotel. It's just, I want to have a guest room. You know, even things like that. Think about what is important to you? What are your, what does your future vision look like in addition to values? Like when I say values, oftentimes I think of things like family and religion and that kind of thing, but it also looks at like your future vision of what does, what does life, what does a great fulfilling life look like to you and seeing if that matches up. So what would you tell people that say that they don't have time to budget? I would refer back to my comment about percentage-based budgets. (laughs) You can make it, I mean, it it takes a little bit of time to set things up. And yes, probably going through and figuring out exactly how much you're spending takes a little bit of time and would be a step. But think about in two months from now, you spend two months kind of figuring it out going, okay, I know we need this percentage for bills and this percentage for that. And we have this percentage left to set, to save this percentage to save this percentage to spend. And then just, you know, your check hits the account, you have it automatically set up to transfer and you're done. Like that's pretty simple. I think in my mind, at least that seems pretty simple. So there, there are ways to, put limits around your spending to make sure that you're meeting your other goals without it taking hours and hours of time. I will also say that, like I mentioned, my husband and I do track everything, you know, penny, dollar by dollar, penny by penny, which I know is anal and there's a reason I'm a financial coach, um, <laughs> money nerd. Um, that probably only takes me 45 minutes a month. So 
it doesn't have to take a long time. And how can you stick to your budget? Are there any tips or tricks that you have? That's one of the hardest ones. I would say, first off, be realistic. If you go into it with the best intentions being like, okay, I'm going to go from not paying any attention to tracking every penny. Uh, that's kind of hard. Or going from, okay, I know we spent $1,000 on eating out at restaurants last month, and this month we're going to spend 200 Again, not that realistic. So trying to be realistic about how much time you have, about going from, okay, so we spent 1000 last month, let's try to cut it down to 900 this month, and then see how that feels and see if we can get down to 800 the month after that until you get to wherever your target is. There's a lot of money behavior that's kind of like um, health behavior, dieting behavior. Like most people who are like, I want to lose weight. I'm going to go on a diet and cut out all of these foods. You don't last very long. <laughs> it's here all of a sudden you're like, okay, fine. I'll, I'm not going to eat bread and I'm not going to eat any sweets and I'm not going to eat this, and I'm going to only eat this and that. And then two weeks later, you know, you're at work and there's cookies sitting out and you're like, oh, I'll just have one cookie. Then you go, well, I had, I had one cookie. So now I blew the whole diet. So I may as well just eat six, or I may as well stop at, you know, Starbucks on the way home from work, even though I said I wasn't going to have any sugar. And it's just same thing with budgeting. Like, well, I'm only going to spend $50 on coffee. And then you get four coffees Okay, that wouldn't quite be $50, but whatever. I'm not going to buy coffee this week. And then you buy coffee one morning. And you're like, well, I got it yesterday, so it's I just blew that. No spend, so I'll just get it again today. So set realistic goals. <laughs> set manageable goals. And then figuring out how to put roadblocks in your way can be really helpful as well. Or making a plan. So if your goal is to cut back on eating out, so what's going to happen? So figure out when do you usually eat out? Do you eat out because it's fun? Do you eat out for convenience? Convenience is a really common one. So if you know, you know, I'm, I work late every Wednesday and Thursday, and then we always just go through the drive-thru. Okay, so what are you going to do to not go through the drive-thru? Because if you work late, you work until six, you have kids, you need to feed the kids dinner as soon as you get home. Like, Spending an hour preparing a meal isn't practical because that just doesn't work. So are you going to do frozen pizza? Are you going to meal prep on a weekend? Are you going to have some other kind of meal in the freezer? Are you going to do a meal kit delivery like a HelloFresh or a um, Home Chef? No, not Home Chef. Whatever, one of those. Plan ahead for this is one of, you know, this is a trigger where when this happens, then I spend money on this. So when this happens, what are you going to do instead? Rather than leaving it to the throw of the moment when chances are you'll just be like, well, whatever. I, I don't have time to think about something else. I'm just going to react the way I always do. And are there any ways that you can help your partner if they have very unrealistic goals? <laughs> I mean, you can sort of take the hard route and just let them fail and then say, yeah, so, okay, so that didn't work out. So can we try it my way this time? Which might work. Or you can have the conversation up front and say, you know, I heard on this podcast I listened to you, somebody saying that setting, you know, really ambitious goals usually doesn't end up working out. What if we try pulling it back a little bit? You know, blaming things on seeing it somewhere or hearing it on the radio can be really convenient, especially if it's true. If you did hear it on a podcast or heard it talked about on the radio saying, I saw this idea, what do you think about trying it? That can help. Otherwise, sometimes, sometimes we as humans have to make the mistake to learn from it, but depends on how costly of a mistake you think it's going to be. And who knows, there are some people, a very small number of people, there are some people who going cold turkey does work well for. So who knows, maybe your partner knows themselves better than you do. And, you know, making that really ambitious goal will work. There's always that possibility too. And how do you get your partner on board with sticking to a budget? That's where those goals come in. So set a goal, make a goal together, make sure you both have buy-in, make sure it's not just you being gung-ho on something and 
and being like, yeah, sure, I guess I'll come along for the ride. Make sure it's something that you're both really passionate about or two somethings that you're both really passionate about. If you're really passionate about travel and they're really passionate about, I don't know, getting a specific car or something like that, set a goal for both. So then whenever you have, so you're saving money towards both things at the same time and then going, hey, did this decision that we made or is this decision that we're discussing helping us get towards that goal, helping us build that life that we want to build, or is it holding us back from what we're trying to do together? So if you can get a powerful enough goal, build a powerful enough vision of what life could look like if you do these things, that's going to be, that I think is the number one motivation. So let's recap. How do you set up a money date and what are the key points you want to cover during the conversation? So setting up a money date, you want to find a time when neither of you is too tired. You're not hungry, so you don't get hangry, (laughs) like me. Um, When you don't spring it on them, so you plan ahead. And then the topic of conversation could really be anything from like just sort of a regular check-in on how are we doing financially? Is there anything we need to discuss? We can good shape. Great. Or, you know, if you're, if this is one of the first conversations to making those goals, talking about, you know, where do we want to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years? What do we want retirement to look like? Especially if you are the future focused person talking to the now focused person about, well, what do we want it to look like when we don't have to work anymore? You know, where do we want to live? What kind of house do we want to live in? Do we want to travel a lot? Are there hobbies we want to do? Trying to build a picture of what that looks like. Or actually, if you're the now focused person talking to your future focused partner about what they want life to look like, like that can feed their soul and be like, oh, they want to know what, well, this is what I want it to look like. And chances are, if they're that focused on saving for the future, either It's just because they're so focused on that and they just want that security, in which case, help them figure out why. Or they're really focused on that because they do have a really strong vision and asking them about it, getting more details can really help bring you closer together too. So tell us how everyone can work with you. So you can work with me by going to my website, which is dreambigfinancialcoaching.com. Like I said, I primarily work with engaged couples, and that's what my website is geared towards. If you are dating somebody and you're like, well, I feel like some of this could be really helpful, or if you've been married and you want to reach out, please feel free to do so. There's a link on there to schedule a free call. And I I never want to turn somebody away by saying, oh, yeah, we're just not the right fit. I always wanted to be, well, we're not the right fit but here are some resources I think could help you, or here is another coach that I know who I think could be a good fit for you, or preferably here's a couple coaches who I think might be a good fit. I always like having multiple options for people. So if you have questions, summary being reach out and I will do my best to help you get some sort of help, whether that's me or somebody else. And tell us about your premarital financial coaching. Who is that good for? At what point should you go? Ideally, I like to start that with couples about six months, six to nine months before the wedding. Um, If you contact me earlier, that works too. If it gets too close to the wedding date, then it just ends up being stressful for both of us because you want to reschedule appointments because you're busy meeting with the florist and the DJ and your wedding planner and the officiant and all of those meetings get crazy. So ideally six to nine months or a little bit more before you get married. If you do reach out to me earlier than that and we decide we want to wait, um, I have homework. Homework's not a great term. I have exercises that you can do to kind of chat and prepare before we work together. Okay, awesome. And where can everybody find you online? So my website, like I mentioned, is dreambigfinancialcoaching.com. You can also find me on Facebook and Instagram with Dream Big Financial Coaching. Awesome. So so thank you so much, Emily, for being with us here today. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Thanks for having me.